is a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee, where he is the ranking member of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee, and he's the co-chair of the Sea Power Subcommittee. He's a very active and respected supporter of the national security forces at work here in Rhode Island, where his leadership helped double the production for the Virginia attack submarine class built right across the bay here at Quonset Point. His, he and his staff have been instrumental in helping General Dynamics Electric Boat and many other companies uh, develop partnerships with the state of Rhode Island for training and developing our high technology workforce. As the co-founder and co-chair of the U.S. Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus, he has raised awareness of cybersecurity issues and led efforts to reinvigorate the DOD Cyber Scholarship Program. Please join me in welcoming back to the podium the U.S. Representative from the Rhode Island's 2nd District, Congressman Jim Langevin. Thank you very much. Ken, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I'm going to, they've got this nifty wireless mic on so I can stay away from the podium if you don't mind. They said I could, they wanted to give it a track, they could sing like Madonna. I said, I don't, the idea was not to clear the room. So <laughs> anyway, uh, good afternoon and, and uh, whatever privilege it is for me to be here uh, with you all today. Uh, once again, uh, fourth year that Sneedy has been running this conference and uh, from everything uh, I've seen, observed, and the people I've had a chance to talk to, it's another, another home run. And I just want to thank you all for being a part of this effort. Uh, we are so proud of our defense industry here in Rhode Island and to be able to highlight all the work that you do and allow everyone to interact with each other is, is so important. I think it creates a, again, continues to create this critical mass of excellence that we have in the, in the defense sector. And uh, I just thank you all for the, the, the work that you do. Um, let me begin by uh, recognizing uh, uh, really the, uh, the people that help coordinate this conference. And I want to recognize uh, my former district director, uh, Tim Del Judas, who uh, chairs uh, Snedia, does a great job working at uh, Raytheon, and also his uh, uh, right hand partner in all this, uh, Molly McGee, and all of the, uh, the, uh, the board of directors and uh, that uh, from, from Snedia. I hope you'll join me in a round of applause for the work that they've done in pulling this conference together. <laughs> as far as Tim goes, by the way, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, I'm going to take all the credit for all the good things he does. Anything bad he does, his bad habits he picked up afterwards. So, Paul, he's your problem now. So, <laughs> but uh, so let me just. Um, uh, say up front, uh, th again, the, the work that you do for our U.S. Armed Forces and, and the nation is vitally important, and uh, now more than ever. And, and I believe that the, the partnership between the public and, and private sectors is, is essential uh, to American innovation. Innovation which in turn drives our uh, technical superiority. And keeping us safe each night I know is not an easy task. Uh, but a grateful nation really does thank you and uh, commend you for the work uh, that, you, uh, that you do now and will continue to do. So let's be clear right now, just for a little situation awareness, obviously. Uh, our nation is resilient and our armed forces uh, are strong. But more than 25 years after the end of the, uh, the Cold War uh, and in the midst of our longest uh, ongoing conflict, we once again really face the need to, to prepare for confrontation and, uh, and competition. Our nation faces an era of unprecedented uncertainty uh, and change. Across the globe, we're seeing the development of advanced military technologies and uh, warfare techniques that mean we can no longer take our military superiority for granted. We face extraordinary threats from our, our adversaries, but uh, I believe that with the right investments and with the right strategy, I believe that we're going to be able to maintain our dominance. But it's not going to happen by accident. We've got to continue to put the, the hard work into it. Again, by doing so, but doing so is going to require us to adapt. And uh, we'll, we'll have to, uh, to take more risks, get creative and innovative in order to meet these challenges so that we never send our men and women in uniform into a fair fight. We simply cannot afford to have uh, anything less than the most capable military in the world, particularly in increasingly denied operating environments. 
So with that, let me say that I'm, I'm very fortunate to, uh, to serve on the subcommittee on uh, sea power and projection forces, as well as the subcommittee on tactical air land uh, uh, forces on the, the Armed Services Committee. I'm also privileged to serve as the, the ranking member on the subcommittee on uh, emerging threats and, and uh, capabilities. Taking all three of these responsibilities uh, in total covers really the gamut uh, of what uh, you spend your days working on, and it offers me insight into a variety of uh, domains that are applicable to the threats that are facing us today. But uh, of course, uh, I am of course uh, particularly fond of the work that's pertaining to the emerging threats uh, that uh, facing our military today. Those are the things that I spend a lot of my time focused on. And uh, as you know, for better part of a, the decade, of course, for the last uh, uh, 10 years, I've been a keen participant when it comes to, to cyber. And uh, certainly, as, uh, particularly as co-chair of the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus that I helped uh, create and co-found and, uh, and still co-chair with, uh, with Mike McCall from, uh, from Texas, my, my partner in crime on, that, uh, on that, that effort. So it's clear to me that cybersecurity and national security are intimately connected. And uh, I, I know that uh, you all understand what, what I mean. You know, we're never going to see modern warfare again without some type of a, of a cyber component uh, in it. Uh, we've worked extensively in this space on the Armed Services Committee, and as uh, we believe it's critical that we uh, not only are able to engage in cyberspace, but also uh, that, that our weapon systems and platforms are protected and defended from malicious cyber activity conducted by our adversaries, and they are working hard at it for sure. With the recent uh, elevation of U.S. Cyber Command to do its own unifying combatant command, we're ushering in right now an, an era in which we've, uh, uh, which, um, uh, we've accepted that every armed conflict going forward is going to again have a, a cyber component as a part of it. This change is an affirmation of Cybercom's growing maturity and ability to defend our nation and provides them with a more coherent structure to execute their mission. I also co-chair the Congressional Directed Energy Caucus in the House of Representatives. In advocating for directed energy on the Hill, I found that while my colleagues may be uh, hard pressed to understand the physics behind the system, I can tell you uh, without a doubt they do have an understanding uh, and an appreciation uh, that, uh, that is getting better and better uh, as, as time goes on, especially as the technology continues to mature. They do understand a lower cost per shot. They do understand a deeper magazine. They do understand faster uh, engagement times. But you've all known this for years. You've worked tirelessly on technologies that would be game changers for our war fighters in the years to come. And we in Congress, because of William, are working diligently right now to make sure that you're supplied with what you need uh, in turn to, to turn that vision into a reality. Things like the electric magnetic, magnetic railgun, the surface Navy laser weapon system, the solid state laser technology uh, maturation program, and the high energy laser mobile demonstrator, just to name a few. These are, the, these are excellent examples of how directed energy technologies have matured in, and really should be transitioned when they're ready. That's my uh, b biggest concern, that the, the, the technology is going to mature to a level that it's ready to be fielded, and there's going to be too much inertia that, uh, that prevents it getting out there quickly. We've got to do a better job of transitioning it when it's ready. DE is similar to electronic warfare, and that there are technological and strategic challenges that we also have to address. Now, the realm of EW, uh, we've made great uh, progress uh, when it comes to the uh, EWXCOM, which was originally organized in 2015 to combat the resurgent threats presented by our adversaries. Our EW capabilities, as many of you know, uh, we really have atrophied over the years. But China and, uh, and Russia, they certainly haven't slowed down. They haven't let the technology uh, just uh, atrophy uh, on their end, just the opposite. They've adapted. And uh, this progress, quite frankly, threatens our, our current conops and technologies. Now, as such, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the WXCOM continues to finesse the Pentagon strategy on electronic warfare and ensures th that uh, we're upgrading our systems and providing our warfighters with this critical capability. And of course, uh, the work being done on a variety of unmanned under, undersea vehicles presents a variety of opportunities to protect our own naval assets and protect, uh, project power, gather information and conduct operations in, conduction, in, in conjunction with our traditional fleet 
all of the world. Also, uh, Rhode Island has become a haven for undersea technologies with Newark, the Undersea, Fe undersea uh, Technology Innovation Center, as well as this electric boat, Raytheon, the suppliers, and all performing critical work right here in the ocean state. The expertise you all bring to this domain is critical to our success on and beneath the waves, and I couldn't be more proud to have such excellence right here in Rhode Island and really throughout New England. Emerging technologies such as these promise to be open, uh, open up significant new warfighting opportunities and complement existing uh, capabilities. We are near the tipping point right now for many of these technologies, and it's incredibly exciting uh, to see the work that you're doing and the progress being made to turn these visions right now into a reality. What's less exciting, though, is, an imagining, is imagining a world where capabilities such as these are used by our adversaries. That's the thing that keeps me up late at night. We cannot assume that we'll achieve success before they do, but we can be sure that they're watching us, that they're seeing what moves we're making, and that uh, they're able to make the same calculations that we are uh, uh, about how to transform how transformative these capabilities can be. And at every turn, they're certainly taking advantage of it. For example, right now, North Korea, one of the most rapidly developing threats uh, before us today, especially as the DPRK continues its unprecedented rate of missile testing and provocations. Uh, since last uh, February, Kim Jong-un has uh, fire, fired more than 20 missiles during 13 tests, and each uh, of these firings uh, has fed into North Korea's iterative development cycle, further protecting, uh, projecting its technology, including the uh, most recent uh, missile test yesterday, where it flew a missile right over Japan. I don't see that, uh, that their provocations are going to change anytime soon, and we have to be prepared to meet the threat and the challenge that they pose. China also uh, progresses on a steady march toward developing uh, an effective class of ballistic missile submarines, producing these boats at, at higher levels than ever before. As you know, too, in the 2020s, China is actually going to produce uh, enough submarines to overtake the number of subs that, that, that we have in the field. And China's growing force of ballistic missile and, and cruise missiles, coupled with this enhanced focus on the undersea domain has placed current U.S. military forces on the wrong end uh, of the cost uh, imposition calculus. And uh, not to belabor the point, of course, but Russia has developed uniquely advanced elect electronic warfare techniques over the last decade, which Russian military strategies, uh, strategists and experts have called the backbone of warfare for the future. So in order to combat, to combat these threats and maintain our technical and military superiority, I believe that we do need to do a, a couple of things. First of all, we need to ensure our priorities are straight when it comes to our investments. Now, um, uh, Wes Bush talked about this uh, earlier today, and I, I couldn't uh, agree more. Uh, I was uh, certainly pleased, to, just ahead of the August recess, that the House of Representatives passed the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2018, which uh, outlines policy directives and authorizes funding for the department in all the right places. We authorized a total of 13 new ships uh, for the fleet, as well as uh, three additional Virginia-class submarines in the out years. We, able, we were able to uh, uh, fully fund the department's uh, innovation efforts and restore funding for some specific uh, projects that, uh, that you're working on that uh, need a little more uh, of a, uh, a boost, such as railgun and, uh, and laser weapon systems. We strengthened cyber cooperation with our NATO partners provided for critical munitions and uh, joint training exercises in the Indo-Asia Pacific region and addressed a variety of unfunded requirements to ease the, uh, the, the burden on, on, on each of our services. We truly prioritized innovation in this bill and as such I'm pleased that this NDAA was supported by the largest number of House members in the last eight years passing 60 to 1. So let me also point out that um, we also need to do a couple of other things. I believe that uh, we need to start really more uh, aggressively embracing creativity and allow ourselves to take risk. You know, recently, uh, Elon Musk said it best, I believe, when he noted that failure is indeed an option. Failure is indeed an option. And if you aren't failing, you aren't innovating enough. Congress has come to accept this mentality uh, among many of our, 
our members. I'd like to see more of an understanding in that respect. With members calling for more aggressive strides in R&D and uh, the Pentagon senior leaders saying uh, pretty much the same. With CONOPS changing as our adversaries adapt, uh, we must be flexible and agile in allowing ourselves the room to take more risk uh, that, uh, that uh, can pay out huge rewards, uh, provide that we learn from our mistakes and improve our collective efforts. You know, the thing is, if you're upfront about the risks and let us know where, we, uh, where there are problems, I know that we can take the plunge together to find out where those solutions are together. You know, we, um, I believe that these are the areas where good communication is important. If we know, again, where the challenges, where the bumps in the road are, that we can, again, can confront the challenges that we're facing, uh, and we do it in a very really proactive way. We cannot try to uh, counter these threats uh, uh, really uh, systemically, uh, missile for missile, um, or uh, ship to ship, so to speak. Uh, this is impractical and unaffordable in the, raw, in the long run. Instead, instead um, uh, we, we have to counter the threats before us in, in other ways, uh, with more in innovative solutions, to, be, uh, to both deter and deny those who, who do seek us harm. I believe that we have to flip the, the, uh, the script using asymmetric opportunities to our advantage and change the cost calculus uh, for our adversaries should they try uh, to engage our military forces. This is where technologies like cyber, directed energy, and electronic warfare come in. Now, we cannot re less rest on our, our laurels, backing away from our, our uh, 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 basking, I should say, in our, our past achievements. Instead, we have to continue to invest in research and development. While the U.S. continues to lead globally in absolute investment dollars, we're rapidly losing ground on a relative basis. Let me just say that again, we're rapidly losing ground on a relative basis. Having fallen in 10th place as a percentage of GDP, falling behind such nations as Taiwan, Germany, South Korea, and, and Israel. And, and, uh, and, uh, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has predicted uh, actually that, that China could actually overtake the U.S. in total R&D uh, spending by 2019. As a nation, we simply cannot allow that to happen. To combat this uh, changing tide, I believe that it's absolutely essential that we pursue things like unmanned systems and automation, extended range and low observable op uh, operations, undersea warfare advancements, and complex system engineering and integration in order to combat instability, uh, deter our adversaries, protect our, our allies, and keep uh, the homeland safe. So finally, let me also uh, uh, say that uh, we have to absolutely find ways to transition these new technologies into the hands of our warfighters as soon as possible and bypass the proverbial valley of death. We owe our warfighters the best technologies that we can put into their hands and we owe it to them to do it as quickly as possible. But to allow these game-changing uh, programs, many of which are born out of your own IRA dollars or through uh, government funding, to languish on the shelf because we're too risk averse to try to bring them to the field is a disservice to our men and women in uniform who every day put their lives on the lines for each and every one of us uh, here at home as well as for our allies around the world. We need to prioritize prototyping efforts and innovative uh, and improve our acquisition strategies to give our military the best technologies that are out there because if we do not, I can tell you this, our adversaries certainly, they certainly will. So let me just say this, defense supported research and development has already yielded many game-changing, state-of-the-art weapon systems and technologies and contributed to economic growth by spurring the, the creation of new industries, companies, and jobs across the country. Continuing this trend and transitioning these technologies is essential to guarantee that America continues to lead the way in cutting-edge development. So I absolutely believe that, uh, that we have and I've said this many times, the best, most capable military in the world, particularly because of the men and women who wear the uniform and uh, keep us safe. But also, let me say, we have the best men and women going to work every day in industry and in our, in our labs to provide our warfighters with the very best tools that they need to do their jobs effectively, return home safely, and prevent our adversaries from doing us harm. That's why America excels, and that's why America is strong. Thank you all for having me here today. It's great to be with you.
thank you for the job that you all are doing on the front lines as well, and uh, be glad to take your questions. Thank you. But you want to go first? Sure. Joe, good to see you. It was a great discussion earlier today on how uh, while we have to leverage commercial technologies, they are not the silver bullet to take the place of the defense R and D spending, and yet we see that money continue to go down. Do you see that changing? Uh, I, I do, and there's going to be guys like uh, myself and, and many of my, my colleagues who uh, believe in R&D to, to get us there. It's, it's been disappointing that our uh, R&D dollars have uh, stayed stagnant or on a relative basis have, have decreased, uh, but we're going to continue to push for it. I know that we live in, in, uh, in tight budget times right now, because the best thing we can do is get rid of sequestration to, as, a, as a start. Uh, that's something that uh, year after year is, is hanging over everyone's head. Uh, sequestration was never uh, really intended uh, to go into effect. I don't think anybody ever really uh, thought it was going to happen. It was uh, this sort of Damocles that was designed to hang over everyone's, everyone's head so it wouldn't happen. But we've got to uh, get rid of sequestration. And then we have to understand that if we are going to take uh, a really asymmetric advantage of the, these game-changing technologies that are out there, it's going to require robust R&D investment. Uh, the things that I talked about here and how our R&D uh, investment has declined, Wes talked about it uh, earlier today, we have to, to change that, that trend. We can't allow uh, other countries to be outspending us on a, on a uh, you know, per capita basis and uh, then to think about how China is emerging uh, as, a, as a regional hegemon and, and, and uh, will be a dominant hegemon if uh, this trend continues. Uh, we've got to turn that away and the, around the only way it's really going to happen is by those long-term uh, R&D dollar investments. latest on the uh, frigate competition that's coming up and what you're hearing from the uh, I'm sorry, repeat it one more time. The, the, the new frigate competition. So I was hoping you could share what you're hearing from the, the uh, Armed Services Committee and the Sea Power Committee on, on the Navy's approach and, and your thoughts on that, their approach. Sure. Yeah, I'm getting, still getting my arms around that right now. Um, I know it's moving forward. I think it's, uh, it's on pace. So uh, I, I think we'll have more clarity in the in the probably the next few months. We're going to be going through certainly the, um, uh, the, uh, the conference process on, on, um, on the NDAA, and I expect that will, uh, that will help move things along as, uh, as well. Uh, I was talking to Senator Reid uh, yesterday, and uh, they expect that they're going to be moving the, um, the NDAA on their side uh, pretty quickly, and that'll get it to conference. And, and then, uh, and then we'll see that'll help enhance the, the, uh, the competition efforts going forward too. Anybody else? Sure. Uh, Congressman, uh, Maine in America was certainly a theme that we all heard about during the presidential election. We're still here today. Uh, obviously our defense supply base is a crucial part of our national security. How would you sort of characterize the, uh, maybe the state of that supply base in terms of the uh, companies that are coming to see you, what are some of their needs, and what more can the supply base do to advocate for uh, continuing to make things in the U.S., especially as it relates to our national security? Sure. I'll tell you, I, I don't think there's ever been a time where there's been broader support for Made in America uh, products or uh, technologies, capabilities, and continuing to make the case uh, where, where you see where we're not uh, buying uh, Made in America uh, tools or, or capabilities or, or products, uh, it's important for companies to speak up. And uh, that's something that we, it sort of gets our attention. There's been broad support within the Armed Services Committee for, uh, for Make it Made in America. Uh, products, and uh, but if there's places around the country 
where you know, your partners are not engaged with members of Congress and and uh, and calling the out situations where we're not uh, strongly supporting Made in America. You know, it's it's important that you that you speak up and let us know, and then say what needs to change so that uh, we really push harder for for Made in America. But I I would just say on the on the Hill right now, I've I've never seen a time where uh, it's it's been stronger than what it is today. I mean, it it always has been a a, a concern. Uh, I can remember um, when I first got to Congress, uh, we were talking about some of the uh, military clothing, particularly the, the berets that was made uh, in some cases overseas. And when industry spoke out and, and we heard from manufacturers about that being the case, it got turned around quickly. But it's because uh, it, you know, it, industry spoke up and, and brought our attention to the, to the issue. So I encourage your colleagues around the country that if they're not engaged with, with, with members of Congress and their staff, uh, now is this no, no time like the present. Congressman, thank you again for being here. All right. Uh, quick question for you on the uh, four accidents that have occurred out in the uh, Pacific with the uh, destroyers and the cruisers. Are you hearing anything from the Navy yet about a, a root cause or we know there's different common denominators, but uh, what you might be hearing on those terrible accidents. Yeah, and, and first of all, thanks for raising that. And, and my, uh, my, uh, my thoughts and prayers are with the, the families of uh, those sailors that, um, that have lost their lives uh, or those that, that were injured. And I, I, I pray for a, a very quick recovery for those that are, are recovering from their injuries. Um, four accidents in such a, a short amount of time is really unprecedented and they're looking at a, a, a thorough and full investigation to get to the bottom of what happened. I was talking to Admiral uh, Gilday yesterday and, and they're looking at it from, from their, their angle. They're just leaving no stone unturned, no indication of, of what the, uh, the cause, whether it's a systemic training issue or there's some type of technology uh, failure component in some or, or, or all of the cases. Um, the Navy, I know, is determined to get to the bottom of it, something that is going to have the attention of the, of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, but um, in, in such a short amount of time, I know, I know obviously in that part of the world it's such a congested area and that may be a, a factor, but um, you know, we've, it's rare that we've seen that type of a, of a situation happen in such a compressed amount of time. Uh, uh, multiple times, so we're going to be continuing to stay on on that, and the investigation is 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 moving forward. And I know we're going to be anxious to get the the results and find out again what happened uh, in each of the cases, but also how do we prevent these types of things from happening in the future? Congressman, thank you for being here. Senator, hello. Good to see you. We're seeing the rebuilding of the nuclear triad, and it's important to our nation. It's important to Rhode Island. Connecticut and the area. I think we're also going to see a reconstitution of the carrier battle, the carrier air ring. Um, all that in the backdrop of healthcare and the cost of healthcare and the uh, Medicaid expansion that we've seen over the last number of years since the Affordable Care Act came around, and that's a good thing. There's going to be an expectation that we're not going to be able to do everything we want to do or in case we really need to do from the defense perspective. Can you talk about what you think? It's going to take a hit because some things we, we're not going to be able to do everything, especially given those major programs of the upgraded nuclear triad, the carrier air wing, other things that I'm certainly I'm not aware of, in the backdrop of uh, Medicaid or Medicare medical costs. Something's going to take a hit on the defense side. Can you speak to that a little bit? So what we've all fought for um, is is a balance on both our um, military spending as well as discretionary uh, non-defense. Um, you saw a, there was a, a, a sharp increase in the amount of uh, funds that were authorized in this, uh, this year's NDAA. Uh, how we're still going to pay for that and, and where it's going to come from. I know that many of my Republican colleagues are uh, fine with coming from discretionary non-defense. We believe that there's going to be more of a balance. I am certainly uh, concerned about the, the, the hollowing out of the force and uh, how our, our military equipment uh, has not kept pace with our, our, our needs and uh, rebuilding our efforts there and of course the investments in, in R&D. 
Um, but again, this is about an adult conversation where we have to uh, look at what our priorities are, what we can, what we can afford, and recognize that we're still confronted with the, the challenges of dealing with a, a significant national debt, annual budget deficits. So uh, in, the, in the long run, we're, we're going to have to come together as a, in a bipartisan way and, and, and deal with our fiscal challenges. Um, we can't be short-sighted about just cutting for the sake of, of cutting. And you know, it's about a balance as, as we go forward. Um, my, my, my guess is this will be a, uh, probably a more uh, be an omnibus appropriations uh, at, the, at the end of the day where we did as we did in the end of the FY17 effort. And we come up with a, a more uh, ba balanced uh, proposal than a lopsided you know, cuts in discretionary on defense and, and just plussing up defense of what you, we've, is on the table right now. But um, the more we can work in a bipartisan way, the better. I know there's not a whole lot of bipartisanship, it seems, going on right now in Washington. But um, you know, the, I think at the, the end of the day, the reality sets in that the budget can't be passed with um, uh, Republicans only. Uh, they don't have agreement within their own caucus. And they're only going to they're only going to get a a uh, bipartisan agreement is to have a the, the, a balanced approach. So, what else? Thank you, Congressman. Hi, John. So you understand technology. You've embraced technology. And how do we get more innovative solutions from? transition more innovative solutions from small and medium-sized businesses to meet the needs of the military's challenges today? Thanks. Uh, good question. Um, so in, in, uh, in acquisition reform in, uh, in this year's NDAA, uh, we have looked for ways to bring down barriers to allowing more uh, commercial off-the-shelf technologies to uh, uh, to make its way uh, into in, meeting some of our, our military's uh, solutions to the military's challenges that we that we face right now, I'm going to continue to look for uh, bringing down barriers to to small businesses being a uh, uh, part of the solution. I know that um, there's I, I hear the complaint uh, from small businesses um, frequently enough that there's still uh, too many barriers uh, to to entry. But I think where we can uh, work with the large companies and encouraging more engagement with, uh, with small businesses, I think it's a, it's a good balance and it ensures that we maintain our, um, our competitive edge by when there's commercial off the shelf uh, and it can, be, it can be added to the equation, we need to make that uh, possible, facilitate it wherever possible. So whether it's through um, acquisition reform or or other types of, of barriers uh, I think we need to do that. I know, by the way, I, I, I'm very supportive of our um, uh, SBIR, SBIR programs uh, and also uh, the, the phase two um, matching grants that we have in, our, uh, in, in Rhode Island now for, for SBIRs. I think that's part of it as well. So it's, uh, again, in, uh, investments in R&D dollars and then once technologies are I developed particularly on, on commercial off the shelf and small businesses we need to help facilitate ways to making sure that, that finds its way into the mainstream. Anybody else? Sure. Congressman, I'm glad to hear you said that Congress recognizes some of the risk issues. You know, we have to loosen up some of the rules so the program managers can take some risk. But a lot of program managers and CEOs tell me that part of the problem are the appropriators to go and take money out of the program as soon as there's the smallest problem. Do you see any of that changing? Or do you see anyone in Congress looking at that or talking about that? Yeah, you, you raise a good point. That's why I addressed it in, in my talk that, look, you know, we've all seen instances where, where there's been failures and certainly on the worst cases, sometimes billions of dollars have been squandered or wasted. And I think that's the, you know, that's the, you know, the part of the problem that in, in the, the fear that you know, we don't want to get too far down the road or we don't want to see taxpayer dollars squandered. But at the same time, we cannot be risk averse 
uh, we, if, if we, again, I, I, that's why I enjoy the work I do in, in overseeing uh, DARPA and in ONR and other research uh, programs. Those are, of course, the, the very high risk, high payoff, and we understand there's a level of uh, failure that we have to accept if we're going to push the envelope. But it also needs to, to, to filter down into the uh, other types of, of R&D programs. It can't just be the high risk, high payoff. Uh, types of R&D. Uh, we have to be more, more tolerant, and I think, in the, 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 I guess the, the best uh, kind of um, defense maybe is a good offense, which means that you, we have to have good lines of communication, and with, with staff, uh, with the, the members on the relevant committees, helping them to understand, you know, where we are in the, in the, uh, the R&D process and where the risks are. And, and if we know that, that there are, uh, when there problems crop up, that, uh, that we're not surprised, that we understand uh, this better in staff, then, then nobody's caught off guard. Nobody can, we're not gonna get down the road and, and significant dollars being, uh, being wasted. We'll be able to hopefully connect uh, better and, and uh, understand where the, uh, the problems are early on and adjust from there. It's, I think, when we, when we get too far down the line and, and uh, the, the, you know, say too much has been, uh, been squandered that we, and we don't, we're getting caught off su uh, by surprise, I think that's the bigger, bigger problem. But we have to also change the, the mindset too, right, in, among policymakers that there's going to be failure if we're gonna push the, the risk envelope. But it, it's something we have to do as a, as a, as a as a country, if we're going to bend that cost curve in our favor, because right now our adversaries, I believe, and the types of kinetic weapon systems they're developing and, and the tools that they're developing, uh, we're on the wrong, wrong end of the cost curve. And the only way to change that around is with R&D investment. Can I just add one sure. Uh, Thank you. A, a, a good, good case in point, and uh, uh, none of us in this room like uh, like CRs. Uh, and I, I, I'd love to be in a in an environment where we're we're uh, appropriating under under regular order, and uh, we actually pass appropriations bills on 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 time. I you know uh, I would have loved to work in an environment way back then when those things happen on a on a regular basis. Those days seem to be long going right now and you know, funding by CR is no way to, uh, uh, to budget if you want to do things in the, in the, in the right way and, and be able to invest and for the long term and, and uh, make program adjustments, uh, by the way, uh, responsibly. And we have to make sure that we are, uh, we're not just budgeting by, by CR. Now, I can tell you what's going to happen, right? I just don't know when. So, you know, I, I we're between now and, and October first before uh, we hit the, uh, the new budget year. Obviously, the new budget is not going to be helped by. Uh, uh, it's not going to be agreed upon by new spending levels by October first. The question is, how long does it does it go before what is self-evident that you know we're going to have a, uh, a an omnibus at some point. And uh, it's going to be, again, a bipartisan effort. And I hope we're not going to do what we did last year, get seven months into the fiscal year before, before cool heads prevail and, and we get the omnibus that, uh, that we know is going to be the result at the end of the day. So I'm going to keep pushing my part, uh, my part to make sure we do it sooner rather than later. Thanks, though. Yeah, I I'm Jay Lustig, I'm with Scientific Solutions. Hello. And we've been fortunate to work uh, with the SBIR program. My concern is that <coughs> for a small company of only a handful of people, when we propose a phase one and then we're awarded a phase one, by the time we actually start that work, it can be eight, nine, ten months. And then if we're fortunate enough to be invited to propose a phase two, 
It can be another eight, nine, ten months, maybe longer if we go into a fiscal year crossover. So that gap between phase one and phase two, we've put our product on a shelf. And just computing power alone can change that dramatically in the nine or ten months that we're waiting. And I'm wondering, are there ways to speed up that process? So uh, on this, I'm all ears. And, and if there's things that we can work on together to, uh, to shorten that timeline, uh, I'd be glad to work with you. And I, by the way, for everyone that in the room here, um, you said you're the ones that confront these these delays and these challenges in, in getting the SBIRs moving faster uh, along the process. Um, please uh, bring me your suggestions and, and let's see how we can work together. Um, I, I'm, by the way, you know, I, I know that you know, as, as a region, Rhode Island could be doing better in capturing more uh, SBIRs. And um, it's, it's been a, you know, it's, it's been a bit of a frustration. I know we've done, you know, okay, but we're at the lower end of, of the, the number of SBIRs that, uh, that we've obtained here in, in, in Rhode Island. And that's why the, you know, we've, we've tried to put some policies in place on the, on the, on the phase two process to accelerate that. But we, we could do better, and uh, it'll benefit not only uh, Rhode Island, but the, the, the region and the country as a whole if we can shorten that timeline on the, on the SPARs. I'm um, ready, willing, and able to, to work with you. My staff and I would be glad to talk with you or uh, anyone in the room. Uh, don't ever sell yourself short. If you have ideas, um, uh, understand you can have an impact on, on how we can improve that process, and I, I'd like to, to hear your input. Thank you very much. Thanks. I understand that you went to the uh, hacker convention called DEF CON. Are there any lessons you might share with us from that experience? Yeah, so this is an area where I think government can try to work with the, uh, the hacker community more than what we, what we have in the, uh, in the past. And I say that from the perspective of, um, you know, the, I think the, the, the Pentagon did a great thing under again the Ash Carter was uh, the person who pushed the the hack the Pentagon uh, program and it had not happened uh, with with uh, Secretary Carter pushing uh, that that program it probably wouldn't have happened but um, I know that the the, the, the Pentagon as a uh, as a program that they uh, a, a a a contract with a, an outside vendor that that uh, monitors their networks and, and finds vulnerabilities. And within, say, a, uh, a one-year time frame, they find, say, a number of vulnerabilities they found in, say, the, the single digits. And with the, um, the, uh, the bug bounty program, that the Hack the Pentagon program, within a 30-day 30 30 time frame, uh, there were uh, over a uh, hundred or so vulnerabilities that were found in their system and at a fraction of the cost for what they what they were paying under their under their contract so engaging the hacker community more on these type of creative uh, bug bounty programs I think is a great way forward I've been pushing um, also for the Department of Homeland Security and really the the, the throughout the dot gov domain to create similar type of, of programs so Doing this, again, this is what I mean when I talk about public-private partnerships, and that's, uh, that's just one, one example. Government's never going to be able to solve, for example, our, our cybersecurity uh, problems on its own. It's going to be that continued, uh, that continued partnership. So uh, I would say keep doing those types of, of things. That's what I, I think I learned the most out of, of uh, that, my visit there. Anybody else? Sure. Hi, Congressman. Uh, Alf Carroll with Raytheon. Hey, um, you, I, I'm enjoying hearing all the discussion about SBR. That's a pe personal passion of mine, and uh, I enjoy partnerships with many small businesses, uh, many here in New England. A question for you. Um, could you share with us your thoughts on what you think might be the key areas we could de-risk or speed integration for direct energy weapons, uh, such as the railgun, but not just the railgun? Could you talk to what you think some of the key areas are that we could de-risk maybe and speed that up into the fleet? 
Well, I know we're on a on a pretty good trajectory there, especially um, the, the Navy, as I've said often, is has been very forward leaning in this in this area. They have a uh, laser weapon system, the 30 kilowatt uh, system on the U.S. USS Ponce, and uh, we're learning a lot just by having it in the field. And the the uh, the sailors are doing things with it that really were not really that we never anticipated that they would be doing in, in terms of uh, uh, targeting and, and uh, making use of the, uh, the, the technology. In fact, to the point where it was supposed to be just on, as a demonstrator on there, then the, the uh, sailors didn't want to give it up. So it's, it's still <laughs> in theater. But we're looking for, for avenues to, you know, to, uh, to ways to speed this technology once it's matured uh, more rapidly. Um, I think we're on a, on a good trajectory right now. My, my concern is about, um, and we, again, we try to address this in, in some programs and, and plans we put in place, but you know, how do we uh, integrate these technologies into our, into our CONOPS once they, it's, it's ready to be, to be fielded? So uh, the one thing that we can do, uh, I'm, I, I'm, the Secretary of Defense is supposed to appoint one individual within the Pentagon who's going to be uh, responsible for overseeing all of our directed energy uh, weapons programs. I don't think that that appointment has been, been made yet, but um, uh, I'm going to continue to press that. I've sent a letter to the, uh, to the Secretary uh, asking for an update on, on when that appointment is going to be made. I know that uh, uh, my colleague uh, the Senate side, uh, Martin Heinrich, a former House guy, but uh, from New Mexico, he actually asked the, the Secretary in one of their Armed Services Committee meetings uh, where that appointment is in the process. But having that, uh, that individual in place will, will help, but also making sure that, that the Pentagon is, is planning for the, the integration of these technologies once they're, once they're ready to be fielded will, will help. So we put in place in, in uh, uh, is that the last year, the year before, into in the NDAA, um, making sure that we're, we're the, the Pentagon is, we're requiring them to think about and report back to Congress as to how they're going to integrate these technologies into our, our um, strategic battle plans are, are part of the process right now. So it's going to be a forward thought rather than an afterthought. Thanks. Congressman, on behalf of Sanidian and everybody represented here, thank you so much for participating You're today. Right. Thank, thank you for you. insightful comments and especially your leadership in Washington on everyone's behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please accept that on our behalf. You bet. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.